Turkish coast, I'm not sure shit that's on this thing. The captain is taken hostage. If he does not play a ransom, his whole ship is gone in flames. With a sword at his throat, he has no choice. These privateers were commissioned to pillage, steal, and burn, all under the American flag. Backed by one of America's greatest statesmen, Benjamin Franklin. Watch the swell. Yeah. Now, a group of underwater explorers is on a mission, searching for the lost traces of America's pirate fleet. Roger that. is on a mission to uncover a lost piece of history. A shipwreck that they hope will match up with a little known story about a band of American pirates on privateers. A privateer is a private citizen who is given a document called a letter of commission or a letter of mark during time of war to engage in commerce raiding against an enemy. What it means is that these private citizens went out there and they captured ships. Jay Usher is the leader of Deep Trek, a team of more than a dozen highly trained divers who work in the offshore oil and gas industry. Sea specialists have come to Wales, bringing their knowledge and experience in search of a shipwreck. So we're using the expertise that we've learned, and we're, we're taking a technology that was created for the oceans, but it's never been used for the search for history. Then we get into electronics and we get into simulators. We get into some of the side scanning type device that we're dealing with. Uh, sonars, 3D imaging. It was almost 30 years ago when a local legend first sparked Jay's imagination. The local story, as it was told to me by an old Coast Guard hand, he told her the story of this American privateer that was then, the way he said it was, they raided Hollyhead, held it ransom, and then one of the ships fled down to the south, never to be seen again. Over the years, local divers have recovered a number of artifacts near Hollyhead, including a large cannon. But Jay felt if the story he had heard was true, there must be much more to be recovered. It's funny, you get a good feeling about certain areas. This site always intrigued me. I always felt like there was more to it. There was, there was something here that needed to be found or uncovered. His search for the Hollyhead Privateer is a journey into a little known chapter of America's history. Guerrilla warfare, kidnapping, and looting on the high seas, sponsored by Benjamin Franklin, one of America's most beloved icons. Continental Army is in desperate need of supplies and manpower. Yeah. 
Benjamin Franklin is dispatched to France to help turn the tide, to persuade the French to join the war against the British. The Continental Congress makes this strange decision. They're going to send uh, the oldest man there, um, who's old enough to be most of their fathers, on a winter crossing of, of the Atlantic um, to go to Paris. Disturbing news awaits Franklin on his arrival. Hundreds of captured American sailors are suffering in British prisons, ravaged by hunger, disease, and cold. So their situation was, was very difficult. If they did attempt to escape and were brought back, they got put in the mill prison in the black hole, as it was called. And here um, it was a um, cavernous room underneath the floors. And indeed for Benjamin Franklin, it's one thing to be getting government documents when you are the, the minister to France, but he's getting personal letters from men who are starving and poorly clothed and freezing in English prisons saying, essentially, help me. And he takes it very, very seriously. Franklin asks the British for an exchange of prisoners, one British for one American. But there is a problem, he doesn't have enough prisoners to exchange. And he has almost no American ships with which to capture them. The Royal Navy, when the war starts, has 265 vessels. On the American side, you can count in the single digits um, for most of the war. In order to secure prisoners quickly, Franklin must turn to privateers. So his goal, rather than to go out and try to take the richest cargo or the most wealthy ships, is actually just to capture English bodies. The local legend of the privateer raid on Hollyhead claims that the ships were American. Jay Usher and his team believe the shipwreck they've uncovered could be connected to the ship's commission by Benjamin Franklin. But the evidence they need to prove it lies beneath the rocky sea floor. Well, right now we're about to launch Deep Tech 1, which is the main diver support boat. Deep Tech 2 is already in the water. She's our survey and support boat during this time. First day, so we've got to set ourselves up. It's a, it's a very dangerous situation where we are. We're right in among the, the, the cliff and the rocks. So we've got to get in tight. The shipwreck site is close to the cliffs and in notoriously treacherous water. To ensure the safety of the crew, the dive boats must be securely anchored at three points. But two of those points are on the water. So I think what we'll do, Derek, is yeah. I'll get you to take Bob in, come right down the middle. Right, keep, 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 swim over keep the a good 10, 15 feet, but don't forget that rock here. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, you can't see it. So come right down the middle, drop Bob. Bob, you go straight into the cliff, find your line. Okay, yeah. got it. All right, watch the swell. Yeah. All right, just point down when I go down again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob bon Curtis will risk the rough water and attempt to hook the anchor lines. Bob and the boat are at the mercy of the waves. One tidal surge in the wrong direction could send them towards the jagged rocks. Oh, do it. Well, I'll stay in there long. Good job. Flag them. 
Black him. Black him. Good. Despite the churning seas, Bolt manages to secure the boat at the three points. The dive team has worked at this site before, and they've determined the remains of the shipwreck are spread out over three separate underwater gullies near the cliffs. Gullies 2 and 3 have been investigated on earlier dives, but Gully 1 has never been explored. It's the only gully that we've never been able to work. It's been covered in an overbed now for the last three years that, that we're aware of, of maybe 10 feet. We know the stuff in the gully, but we can't get through the shale and the lock to get at it. So there's been some big storms throughout the winter. And what we're hoping is that, that that's going to give this project the opportunity to go through gully one and, and, and sort of see what artifacts are left. Now, Jay Usher gets ready to head down and determine whether Gully One could be the key to solving this mystery. A band of Irish smugglers is on the run. After a daring escape from jail, they sneak back to their impounded ship in the Dublin Harbour. With guards just meters away, they pull the anchor and begin drifting silently into the Irish Sea. If these criminals are caught, they will face the gallows. The ship's captain, 25-year-old Luke Ryan, is the first. I mean, he really is a story in himself. Stealing a ship right underneath the British noses, getting half of his crew out of the jail. At that point, he says to his crew, look, we've been smuggling a long time, but we just stole a ship. We're in big trouble. All right, what are we going to do, Luke? And Luke says, I got a plan. Ryan knows that the privateer commission from America could save his crew from the hangman's noose. If caught under the American flag, they would be considered prisoners of war, not criminals. He will have to do something, or he will be um, tried and executed. So he can either sort of try to disappear and hide, which people did, or he has this other option to go to Dunkirk and to seek a commission. So it was a smart idea, and he really doesn't have a lot of other options at this point. Ryan and his crew set sail for France, and this band of smugglers pins its survival on becoming privateers. Jay Usher begins the search of Gully 1 by conducting a metal detector sweep of the site. The detector sends a magnetic pulse back and forth into the seabed, emitting a tone when the pulse hits metal. signal comes from the metal detector. A large piece of metal is protruding from the seabed. Oh, 
Yeah, the metal detector couldn't tune it out. So many hits it was just a, a permanent permanent song. This gully is just alive. You literally turn it on its side, it's still singing. The only way you get it to stop is bring it up a cliff. Bring it back down again, it's just full. Yeah. Get that or shut it off. Um, Excavator Derek Corley dives down to begin work on the large metal find. About this one so far. Still going about this deep. Yeah, he's got two markers down there for me right now, so I'm going to start working those two areas. I'll be filling that sucker up. Okay, we're going to do the second batch. The artifacts from the ship are sealed in a concrete like material on the sea floor. It is Derek's job to get them out. You can see the darkness, can you see those there? Derek uses a pneumatic drill. But the job is no small task. One wrong move could shatter the piece and destroy an important clue that could help identify the wreck. Year of negotiation, Benjamin Franklin has convinced the French to join the war against the British. It is a resounding victory for Franklin and a sign of hope for America. The Treaty of Alliance uh, between France and the United States is one of the decisive moments that actually wins the war for, for America. Um, America will not have money, it will not have military support. But Franklin's efforts to organize a prisoner exchange are not going so well. Hundreds of Americans are still rotting in British jails. So when a shipping agent offers a privateer for hire, it is difficult for Franklin to refuse. He said, Ben, all we need is your signature right here. Press our three copies. And uh, so he commissioned the first ship, not knowing if it was going to work out. He needed British prisoners of war so he could try to get some of the colonists out. And Franklin is pleased that the ship is to be captained by an American, Stephen Marshall. But Franklin is being deceived. Marshall is captain in name only. In reality, the Irish fugitive Luke Ryan is in command. The American actually thought he was commandeering the ship. Um, what he didn't understand were, was that uh, the ship uh, was an, uh, almost entirely of Irishmen from the same community, and they understood that their captain was Luke Ryan. Luke Ryan sort of needs Marchant, especially initially, because Franklin might have been reluctant to give a commission to not just an Irishman, but an Irish smuggler who technically had committed an act of piracy. With Franklin's commission in hand, Ryan's ship is outfitted and heavily armed in France. It is renamed the Black Prince. The first of Franklin's privateer fleet is born. Like many privateers, the Black Prince was small, only about 20 meters long. Privateers were not designed to fight much larger British warships, but for quick strikes on merchant ships to steal their cargo. Literally what you're doing is attacking the shipping, the merchant shipping of a nation. 
And England was very vulnerable to this strategy for two reasons. First of all, it's an island nation. A lot of what they need is going to come in by sea. And secondly, they had their economy really relied upon their trade and commerce. It is the backbone of their economy and it was the backbone of their empire. The Black Prince was armed with 16 cannons and 30 swivel guns, smaller weapons that turned on a pivot. These small privateer vessels had huge crews, between 70 and 100 men. They're packed in there. Wouldn't be comfortable by our standard, that's for sure, especially in bad weather. <laughs> trying to free the large metal piece at the right site. If it appears to be from a small, fast ship, it could be more evidence the wreck is a privateer. Alright, so we're through all the way up to here. But it's still very solid with all my strength. We're not even beginning to punch it. And it looks like it's pretty big. While one diver works below, another is coming up with new smaller fires. This piece of copper, along with previous finds, shows no markings, which makes it more likely that this is not an official ship, but instead, one eager to cover its tracks. The British were very thorough at marking their naval ships. The privateers, on the other hand, were the total opposite. Little covert operations, you know. As evening sets in, the team decides to call it a day and return tomorrow to pull up the large metal piece. We've got an artifact down there bigger than anything we've had to date. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to drag it out tomorrow at some point. Sort of working on it very heavily today, but uh, too big to even get out today, so that's great. Stay tuned, hopefully we'll pull it up tomorrow. It is really promising. Today is the second of their five-day expedition. Hopes are high that the team can connect the large metal piece to Benjamin Franklin's privateer fleet. But to do that, they must get it to the surface. It's pretty, pretty dark down there compared to yesterday. But uh, we did some measurements. Got our, our main hole marked out, laid out, and uh, started to uncover some more of the rod. It's looking good. It's actually laying along the seabed. It's got a nice arc to it. It's it's pointed at one end and it's it's quite thick. Eric Corley is heading down to continue getting the piece out. the metal glass in the bottom. Minutes later, the largest piece the team has ever found breaks the surface. Uh, it was laying right over a nice hard rock. Yeah. So I got the hammer yeah. and, the the leverage hammer going. and just started working it, working right. it, and then everything started to break loose. Beautiful. That's great. 
Benjamin Franklin's Black Prince is on our Virgin Cruise around the British Isles. Her orders are to capture as many prisoners as possible. This ship, like other privateers, operated undercover, often masquerading as an official British vessel. Once a merchant ship was in sight, the privateers would fire warning shots and pull alongside. Privateers would run up the American flag and take the merchant crew hostage. Their tactics worked like a charm for the grind. In its first week at sea, the Black Prince takes seven ships and 35 British prisoners. They really seemed to know what they were doing. They had chosen well where they chose to cruise. Um, they were functioning well as a crew. So it would appear, if you're Franklin and you're getting sort of eventually getting reports of this, it would appear to be a, a very good venture. But there is a problem. The Black Prince barely has room for her own crew, let alone 35 prisoners. If I'm one of the privateers, I got Ben saying I need prisons. Well, I have a huge problem here. Because I really don't want to feed and take care of all of these folks. Ryan makes an executive decision. He keeps 21 prisoners on board, but lets 14 others go. Franklin may not know it yet, but his aims and those of his ragtag band of pirates are already at odds. On day three of the expedition, the dive team has brought the large metal piece to their lab in nearby Hollyhead. Did you find the artifacts? Yes, I saw the facts. Uh, good. Got it? Good. Okay. I got the light in. Marine archaeologist Jim Sinclair is getting a look at it for the first time. What do you think, Jeff? It's a great piece. The team has recovered hundreds of smaller artifacts from gullies 2 and 3, including nails, copper sheeting, and even personal items. But this one gives them new information. Now, we, we normally keep this in water, but I'm just going to take it out so I can explain to you a few of the things that we're seeing on this. What you're seeing in these areas, and there's probably a couple more down this way, are the pinholes that would have been on this to attach it to the keel. This we think is a keel shoe and it was used on wooden vessels that had the problem of running into really hard things like ice and or rocks um, and this was to help prevent the keel being crushed in right away so it's sort of like a bumper for a large wooden hull vessel. The keel runs along the bottom of a ship to keep it steady in the water. Sinclair dates the shoe to the latter half of the 18th century, the period when Franklin's privateers would have been active in the region. Other evidence to suggest the wreck is a privateer includes a large number of cannonballs found on previous dives. done an analysis of them so that we know that these were uh, all of uh, uh, size that don't really match up with what the English were using here. As a matter of fact, the size of the cannonballs and the musket balls that we found are distinctly of a French origin. So we know that this ship was outfitted in France. Luke Ryan's ship would without doubt have carried French weapons. The team is closing in on the truth. But will they be able to connect their finds to Benjamin Franklin's Black Fleet? Oh uh, yeah, that's a nice piece. For four months, Benjamin Franklin's privateers have been raiding enemy ships, 
looking for sailors to exchange for Americans in British prisons. The campaign appears to be a success. The Black Prince has taken over 34 British ships and captured a total of 52 prisoners. Now, Luke Ryan, who had allowed the American Stephen Marshall to appear in charge, reveals to Franklin he was captain all along. Ryan was courageous. He was bold. He made good maritime decisions. He's a good captain, actually. So from Franklin's point of view, he's got someone who's effective. You may not have liked the deception, but it's a war. <laughs> it's a war and there are people rotten in jail. With Ryan's success, Franklin commissions two more ships, the Black Princess and later the Fiat. It is only now, after the taste of success, that Franklin decides to tell Congress about his unorthodox rescue plan. Continues to explore Galley One, while Jim Sinclair and Jay Usher head to the local archives. We've got a copy of the Dublin Journal from uh, 1780, and in this we've got the story of the Hillsborough and the Bessborough packet ships, the mail ships that came out of Hollyhead being taken by, and it says, I'm sorry to acquaint you that the Hillsborough and Bessborough packet boats have been taken by the Black Prince and Princess privateers. And these are Franklin ships. And the Black Fleet were right here operating off of Hollyhead, which is only four or five miles away from where we're working. The newspaper confirms two of Franklin's privateers plundered the seas near Hollyhead. It's further evidence that the local legend is based on fact. The report also provides an insight into the true motivation of the crew. It's clear that the goals of Benjamin Franklin and his privateers were at odds. It's really kind of obvious here. The fellows that were on board were sort of piratical to begin with. Where it talks about the passengers on board the two packet boats, this is the Hillsborough and the Bessborough, of course, were very rudely used by the men who boarded them. They not only gave them the most insulting languages they had, uh, and behaved in the most indelicate manner to the women, but stripped both the crew and the passengers of everything valuable they could lay hands on. I mean, that, that, that's just an act of piracy. They took everything that wasn't bolted down. There's no mention of even taking prisoners. It's just, you know, let's take what's valuable. Franklin wants prisoners so that he can perform exchanges. Prisoners are not worth any money for the privateers. What they want are prize ships that are worth a lot, carrying a good cargo, um, or ships they can ransom. And in fact, having extra captives on board is, makes their goals more difficult to achieve. Jay and Jim stumble upon another clue. Historical records reveal that the Black Prince and the Black Princess sailed to Dublin after the raid on Holyhead. And Franklin's third ship, the Fearnot, is accounted for hundreds of miles away. However, the local legend describes a ship that disappeared after the raid, then sailed south, putting it on a direct course past the wreck site. Could there have been another ship aiding the privateers? I mean, I think one of the, the interesting things about this, Jim, is that there's the talk of here the Black Princess and the the, the Princess Privateers. It, again, it alludes to that the third ship or more was there. And, that, and that's interesting because, you know, to capture two ships 
and take them and hold them. You know, it, it's quite a fleet. You know, you know, it, it's it's a hard thing to do. Yep. A lot of armament, a lot of swivels, a lot of a lot of a lot of firepower. This escort ship theory could be the key to identifying the wreck. This is the missing link, Jim. We've got to find. Is this our ship? If we can now take this archival information that we found, put that to what we're finding on the seabed, and let's see if we can tie this together. So the team turns to cutting edge technology to expand the search area. A device called a sub bottom profiler. You know, we have expeditions where we have things that are buried uh, below sand or sometimes rock or large amounts of sediment, and that's when we bring in the sub-bottom profiler, which is that catamaran-type device, and it had four large transducers on there. And if you think of them as glorified fish finders, but what they really do is they can penetrate the soil. Profiler will enable them to search a larger area in case there are key pieces of the ship buried outside the dive zone. We call it mowing the lawn because we think about going back and forth as we mow the lawn. And I've got our four beams that are going down that are giving us the image that we're after right now. So we're going to go from point to point uh, to try to get a much better picture of anything that may be subsurface on the bottom in this vicinity. But a full analysis of the results will have to wait until they return to the lab on shore. Meanwhile, the other team is working at Gully 1. There is another large piece here. It's metal, about 60 centimeters long. Derek starts another round of delicate work, drilling around the object and fighting to set it free. But it's not budging, and the clock is ticking. This may be the last chance for the team to bring up any evidence from the ocean floor. Franklin's undercover fleet has captured a huge number of enemy ships, but nowhere near the number of prisoners Franklin hoped for. Instead, Luke Ryan submits parole slips to Franklin, papers signed by prisoners stating they were officially captured, but the prisoners were actually released and free to go home. The concept of war in the 18th century is very different. Um, there is this idea that, that war is at times almost a gentlemanly thing. The parole slip is really fascinating. It just seems outrageous. The problem with the small crew is I don't want to take all these people on my boat. So a parole slip, what it, what it means is I get credit for capturing you even though I'm not going to keep you. They're letting prisoners go right and left. You feel very sorry for Franklin, because this is not at all what he wanted. Franklin tries in vain to get the British to accept the parole. So prisoners have been exchanged between America and Britain. Most of the Americans continue to languish in British jails. At the lab in Hollyhead, the team is reviewing the data from the sub-bottom profiler sweep. 
There is no evidence of any large objects outside the dive site. In a single day, the profiler has ruled out an area that would have taken divers weeks to search. But down below, time is running out, and they need to get what could be a crucial piece of evidence to the surface. July 1780 is a turning point for Benjamin Franklin's war strategy. His privateers are taking lots of his time, but producing few results. Franklin needs prisoners, but he's not getting them. So in 1780, he decides to fire his pirates. So the ultimate yield was 95 prisoners for all of the fuss and bother and, you know, these, these several different cruises that go out over 18 months. So from Franklin's point of view, he didn't achieve from it what he would have liked. Franklin hands over his ships to France, but Luke Ryan is not done yet. Under the French flag, Ryan continues to harass the British for another year, until he is captured by the Royal Navy and sentenced to death for high treason. There's a stay of execution and an eventual pardon. But then, eventually, he ends up in prison anyway. I think in 1789, he dies in prison for a 100-pound debt. So for all of his sort of adventures and travails and, this, and his cleverness and his leadership and all these talents he possessed, in the end, he, he ended up dying in jail anyway. At the end of the war, Benjamin Franklin tried, and failed, to write an article into the peace treaty, banning privateering in future wars. Franklin decided, probably based on his experience working with privateers, that privateering would be inappropriate um, for any um, nation at war in future. So I think he's aware of the time and, and losses that occur as a result of privateering. On their fifth and final day of diving, the team is working on what may be the most important piece of evidence so far. Go over to the, uh, to the rig a second. It's a large, circular metal object. Like the others, it's stuck in the concretion on the gully bottom. With time running out, they finally free it and bring it to the team on the surface. This is the piece from today's finds. I think it's one of the best pieces I've seen. We've had some beautiful stuff off here, but this is just magnificent. I mean, I mean, it's great. You can see exactly what she is. She's part of the rigging. She would have held either a spar or part of the bowsprit, and that would have been right in this section here. The bowsprit is the small pole extending from the front of the ship, which holds sail rigging. So this would have been holding one of those sections, and it would have gone right through here. And what's great is, you can see right here where they would have opened it up. So it's like a clamshell. They would have undone this, opened this up here. This is a hinge. Open this up, put it through, and then bolted it down and then tightened it up. The clamp has no identifiable markings. Nothing that could suggest where it was made. But in the clandestine world of the privateer, no markings is a bit hidden. The bowsprit clamp and the keel shoe together are compelling evidence. What is really important about this particular expedition is we have the dates quite accurate. We found an incredible amount of items there that are very valuable, same ship, and classifying this as a privateer, just enhancing this entire shipwreck. The 
Teams also confident about the size of the wreck. They believe the ship was between 70 and 85 feet, or around 22 meters. A small, fast ship dating to the period of Franklin's Black Fleet. I think that we have enough information, we have enough uh, as enough artifacts to go, this is the ship of the right period. But records definitively show that Black Prince and Black Princess escaped to Ireland after the Hollywood raid described in the 1780 report. And the third ship, the Fearlot, was far off in Scottish waters at the time. But the local legend says one ship fled south. If the third ship wasn't one of the known Black Fleet, it could have been an escort ship, sometimes used by pirates for support on their roads. They had an opportunity to strike and escape. And that's what these guys did. So we had the Black Prince, the Black Princess and their escort ships. You know, and they they were raiders. I mean, they, they'd wait in these coves right around us, and they'd wait for unsuspecting ships, or they'd wait for the packet ships going between Hollyhead and Dublin. To confirm Jay's theory, they need the name of the ship the dive team has found to connect it to Franklin's fleet. This is a large jigsaw. And, and what we're trying to do is find the, the correct pieces of the jigsaw and every piece tells a story, you know, but we're trying to find the whole story. Only time will tell if this wreck is part of a largely unknown story in American history. A time when a small band of pirates were able to torment the mighty British Navy, bringing the American Revolution to the shores of Britain.